नमस्कार सुप्रभातम वेलकम टू वन एंड ऑल एट द वर्चुअल कैंपस ऑफ इंद्रशील यूनिवर्सिटी uh we remember my friend dr mohan hello hi dr hello good morning are you looking very good oh, thank you thank you lockdown has made everybody look good looks like <laughs> no proper lighting is necessary acha <laughs> lighting lakshya no you have already lighting face so we don't need yeah that is what i'm going to tell that uh, indrashil university cloud is shining with the two bright stars uh, one is dr mohan rao the other is dr yadav and both are eminent scientists of their own field one from biology the other from chemistry so this is a deadly combination and the iu cloud is shining with these two bright stars the other stars which have joined us is dr bharti dave dean school of science dr amish vyas dean school of engineering my colleague who is uh, hod department of bioscience dr vijay singh and my colleagues who are also attending along with students so welcome all to indrashil university on this warm morning and uh, please students don't miss this opportunity as dr mohan rao is going to bring with or is going to share with us the treasure of knowledge which is a one time opportunity for you all so please don't miss this opportunity keep dropping please listen first and keep dropping your queries if you have any in the q and a box and in the q and a box for the sake of identity please mention your name semester and stream so that it is easy for us to address you personally that sounds you know good when you are there and you are addressed with name so without much delay i now invite our provost and director of research dr j s yadav who is again an eminent scientist for the opening remarks Over to the other side. Oh, I thought you. It was. Oh, I thought it was just going for genesis of Cadilla Farmers. Uh, sir, that was revised, and uh, Bharti Madam is going to share the introduction. Oh, okay, okay, that was uh, not told to me. Yes. Okay, uh, you, you folks, you know that we have. You know. <laughs> Almost the webinar we had in chemical engineering, then we have chemistry, then we have mathematics. Sorry, mechanical engineering. So why we should leave uh, biology behind? So this because this university is a life science university, focusing on life science. So this was very important that we should have a webinar on biological sciences, and then you don't find better than. Dr. Mohan Rao. Uh, later on, Dr. Bharti will introduce. <coughs> I will say that you know, which is not written in many of this CV. He is, you know, always among the students, young students. If he goes and talks to high school student, even junior high school student, we will go to that level and explain to them. If he goes to the intermediate or undergraduate he will go to that level and teach and when he goes to a conferences national or international conferences where high level science is involved he will discuss like you will not find all this quality in one person he had you know all the level you can expect of course when you hear his lecture and many of you might have heard him During this inspired program we have organized, then you will appreciate, and uh, and he will definitely tell about the biology, what the biology can do, what the biology can do for you, or for the world, or the benefit of the people, and of course, he may tell biological things are very complicated. You know, if we talk research. In our own body, we have not understood it. So, lot of research is required in biological science. Take any life science, life sciences, living objects. 
either our own our crop horticulture plant anything you take we need biological intervention okay so very important and i don't think you know things biological systems are so complicated that many life it will take to understand i don't know whether at the end we'll understand or not but the kind of equipment kind of facility kind of things are coming up i think it need possible so i will not take much time uh, you know the later on dr bharti will introduce you uh, dr monra only thing we were co director together he was at heading ccmb i was at it was a pleasure to have a neighbor like him a neighbor neighboring director we used to do so many things together and uh, any time i have requested him to for benefit of you people to deliver lecture or come for interaction he has always obliged i am very thankful to him and now you will enjoy don't go away any questions you have keep it in the question answer box as what namrata said so again i will welcome to all of you where i can see amish bias bharti is there namrata is there abhinand is there oh my can see but there are many more for this webinar and i'm sure you will enjoy it now over to dr bharti thank you madam sir before i invite bharti madam i also want to share that you both have a common thing both are bhatnagar shanti swarup bhatnagar fellows also so i just wanted to add that which out of modesty you couldn't add that and uh, further to this uh, you had shared with us many more uh, uh, feathers in the cap of mohan rao sir and his qualities which actually any you know uh, this uh, credentials could not capture thank you so much sir and over to bharti madam for introduction you, of you my... you don't know one more common things both are <laughs> in chemistry okay and then <laughs> okay. i remain interested in even to biology <laughs> okay. and all all leading biologists are either chemists or physicists by the way <laughs> so nice of you sir <laughs> not in india even in world okay great sir unfolding yes. another secret after secret that is so right. sign thank okay. you so much sir over to thank dr bharti yeah over to bharti madam for introduction of ayu as well as our speaker today anuj bhai anuj bhai yes ma'am slide share so uh, on behalf of indrashil university i welcome you all to this webinar which is going to be delivered by dr mohan rao who was the former director of center for cellular and molecular biology hyderabad Uh, if i give a brief next slide if i give a brief introduction of our university the source behind establishing this university and the way in which we are functioning now is shri indravadan bhai a modi who was the founder chairman of cadilla pharmaceuticals limited and who was popularly known as the medicine man of india besides being a very humble generous and modest person he was a nationalist at heart he believed that medicine should be affordable and should reach to the last uh, person of the society and based on his vision indrashil university was established as a philanthropic initiative of our beloved founding chancellor dr rajiv i may modi in loving memory of his parents shri indravadan bhai ambalal modi and shrimati sheela ben modi who laid the foundation stone of cadilla pharmaceuticals limited in 1951 if we see to the success of uh, his history and his uh, success as such uh, when cadilla pharmaceuticals was established in 1951 it was established in one small room in a village named as hasur in baruch district 
Shri Indravadan Bhai used to move on a bicycle for about 35 to 50 kilometers per day, marketing and selling his products. His wife, Srimati Sheila Ben Modi, was the first employee of Cadillac Pharmaceuticals Limited. She was the perennial source of inspiration to her husband, Sri Ambalal Bhai Modi, uh, in starting the manufacture of uh, the indigenously Cadillac gripe water, which was the first gripe water which was manufactured in India and which brought smiles to millions of parents and children across the country. So to honor the legacy of care and compassion, the university's governing Modi, Modi and Dr. Rajiv Modi are determined to holistically transform and develop this university into a global academic excellence in terms of both teaching as well as research. Next slide, please. If we see to the milestones of success of a university, Cadilla Pharmaceuticals, previous one, Cadilla Pharmaceuticals was established in 1951. It has now, it, its presence felt in 90 different countries with over 10,000 employees. And it is one of the largest privately held pharmaceutical company of our country. In 2016, Cadilla Pharmaceuticals took up an initiative of starting Sri Saraswati Education Foundation. But it was in 2018 that Indrashil University was established as the first life sciences university of our country. And seeing to the success of our university, it was within the same year that Niti Ayo, Government of India, had supported us with Atal Incubation Center with its flagship program to encourage the youth of our country to initiate their startups and become future entrepreneurs of our country. Again, in, within the same year, it was Indrashil Innovative Foundation, which was established as student startup and innovation policy exclusively funded by the government of Gujarat. Next slide, please. As I always tell, the success of any institute depends on the leader who mentors that institute. And as our mentor, we have Dr. J.S. Yadav, who is the provost of our university, who is the director of our university and who has been the former director of Indian Institute of Chemical Technology, Hyderabad, as he had said in his opening remarks, uh, as Namrata Madam has said, we have two Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar awardees today in the IU cloud. We have uh, Dr. J.S. Yadav, who has also been conferred with Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Fellow, one of the highest uh, uh, level of awards which is given by, uh, by our country. And he has also been conferred with Jesse Bose National Fellow. Recently, just 15 days before, he had in, in it is Indian Chemical Society who has conferred upon him the Lifetime Achievement Award in Chemistry, which we need, which our university needs to be proud of. If you see to his research credentials, uh, which can be, uh, you can see a sort of benchmark to any youth, any scientist or faculty who wants to build up their career in science. He has 150 plus patents to his credit. Just last month, he has been granted with one more patent, 1400 publications, 250 PhD students, and we still have 11 to 12 students working under him for that PhD in our university. Thousands of citations. They are innumerable 27,000 citations. Next slide, please. At Indrashil University, as I've told you, as we focus both on academics and research, our major objective is to provide academic excellence in terms of teaching. As our parent institute is Cadilla Pharmaceuticals Limited, and our second major objective is to make the students industry ready, future ready, and our curriculum is tailored in such a way so as to give the students enough industrial exposure we offer internships to the students in, in the industries and we help them for their placements. And we focus on overall development of the students, not only in academics and research, but even in co-curricular as well as extracurricular activities. And we have tried to achieve, and we are trying to achieve global academic standards. Our university is a young university. We are into a third year, but a young and beautiful university. Next slide, please. Under the umbrella of Indrashil University, we have School of 
engineering as well as school of science school of engineering offers btech in computer science and engineering btech in mechanical engineering btech in chemical and our university probably is the first in gujarat to offer an honors degree at an undergraduate level we offer bsc honors in biosciences we have ms in chemistry we have ms in animal biology msc in microbiology and we have phd programs under both the schools and as i have told you we have tried to achieve global academic standards we have entered into collaboration with three foreign universities one is sacred heart university usa tuskegee university usa and newcastle university uh, australia sacred heart university and tuskegee university at present our collaboration is with computer science and engineering where the scheme that has been offered is 3 years in at our university one year at that university and then they would be offered a dual degree both from indrashil university as well as from sacred heart and tuskegee university whereas with newcastle university we are entering into collaboration with respect to a uh, post uh, a masters program in chemistry which would be completed soon next slide please Uh, as i've told you both schools of engineering as well as school of science the success of any university or any you can say schools depends on the infrastructure laboratory facilities that the university has our university has extremely sophisticated state of the art infrastructure facilities both in terms of laboratories as well as in terms of equipments we have highly sophisticated analytical instruments which are available to students of both these schools it may be engineering it may be chemistry it may be biosciences we have a number of gas chromatograph gcms thin layer chromatography ftir spectroscopy ir spectroscopy all the equipments which are required for microbiology lab for biotechnology laboratories for cell biology laboratories etc next slide please this picture shows the extremely sophisticated state of the art infrastructure facilities that i've told you they are at par to all the national uh, institutes that are, that the uh, where the facilities are available next slide please uh one more flagship uh, to our uh, uh, that has been added to our university as recently we have procured nmr at our university it is the our university is the first in gujarat to have nmr with us it is not only available to faculty as well as scientists working over here it is also available to research scholars as well as post graduate students so this nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy is widely used to determine the structure of any organic molecules it can be used in quality control and research to determine the content and uh, purity of the sample it can also be used to determine the conformation of molecules in solution next slide please this picture shows the uh, sophisticated analytical instruments that we have as i've told you we have a number of hplc from highly international uh, branded companies as waters perkin elmer etc next slide please next slide Huh. this shows gas chrome number of gas chromatograph chromatographies that we have laminar flow system that we have we have mostly all the equipments that are required for complete organic synthesis for conducting microbiology experiments for conducting cell culture experiments as well as biotechnology experiments next slide please as uh, we have told you previously we have entered into mous with a number of industries uh, cadila pharmaceuticals is our parent company we have entered into mous collaborations with a number of csir laboratories one of which you can see over here is national chemical laboratory pune we have entered into collaboration with indian institute of chemical technology hyderabad with central salt and marine chemicals research institute bhavnagar our students go for their internship programs for four to five months at these csir laboratories we have collaboration with apollo hospitals gbfl entrepreneurship development institute of india megman industries etc next slide please this slide shows the industrial uh, internship and visits that are conducted by university when the situation was normal 
we at least used to conduct one industrial visit per month so that the students know the requirements that are needed by the industries, the type of curriculum that should be framed, what are the requirements of industries, etc., so that they become industry employable. Next slide, please. As I've told you, we even offer this thing, we give a platform for extracurricular activities. It may be sports, it may be cultural activities, it may be Garba. We are now celebrating the Navratri, which is one of the most uh, vibrant festival of Gujarat. Next. Hmm. Uh, at Indrashil University, as I've already told you, we have been supported by Niti Ayog with Atal Incubation Center and Indrashil Innovation Found uh, Foundation. Uh, with the student startup and innovation policy exclusively funded by the government of Gujarat, where the students and if they have any novel idea, we provide them platform and they can initiate their uh, startups. And naturally, the proposals would be screened if they are found to be proper, we give them in uh, platforms. Next slide, please. So at these incubation centers, we give them access to world-class R&D laboratories. We offer them dedicated office and laboratory space, and we provide 50 lakh kickstart support, about two crore of rupees at seed fund support. We provide them handholding by renowned mentors, which can be from industry, which can be from government departments, which can be from R&D laboratories, both public as well as private. We provide them NSS at work and we provide them complete support if they want to take up, if the startup is successful, and if they want to take up startup to a sustainable, sustainable business. Next slide, please. So uh, if uh, anybody requires any detailed information, they can visit our website at www.indrashilluniversity.edu.in. Uh, they can, if in, if with respect to admissions, they can drop an email at admission at indrashiluniversity.com and they can contact the person concerned at the number which is available over here. Next slide, please. Uh, so, thank you. So, before I hand over the platform to Dr. Mohan Rao, uh, for which all of us are waiting for, let me give a brief introduction of Dr. Mohan Rao. Dr. J.S. Yadav has already introduced him as to his uh, this thing, knowledge in uh, biology, etc. A very, you can say, a popular person in, if you consider biology. So Dr. Mohan Rao was the director for Center of Cellular and Molecular Biology, Hyderabad, which is a premier national laboratory of our country, and which every biologist has a dream in their career to visit CCMB once in their lifetime. He is currently a CSIR distinguished scientist. He is an eminent scientist, innovator, science administration administrator and a science popularizer he is the elected fellow of all the three major science academies of our country he is the elected fellow of the third world academy of sciences council of international union of pure and applied biophysics federation of asian and ocean indian biochemistry and molecular biology and he has been a visiting professor and scientist at number of foreign countries as usa japan France, Australia, etc. He is a recipient of Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Award as our provost of our university, Dr. J.S. Yadav is. Recently, University of Hyderabad has conferred upon him the Distinguished Alumnus Award. Sir combines biophysical, molecular biological, and cell biological approaches to investigate problems of biomedical importance. He is well known for his extensive contributions in the area of molecular chaperones and heat shock proteins which are used in health and disease. He has developed a scientific diagnostic chip which has been developed by his team and which has been commercialized by Cyton Diagnostic Limited and which was recognized as the product of the year 2008. And this particular contribution has also received a biotechnology award in the Asia Pacific region for meeting a major unmet need. In addition to his outstanding contribution to basic sciences, as has been said, he has excelled in product innovation. He is a science administrator and he plays a significant role in science popularization among school and college students, as Dr. Yadav sir has said, and the general public through various activities. As he had said, at any level, it may be at the level of 10 plus 2, it may be at the level of college, it may be master's and PhD as well as scientist level. He can talk on any 
topics and any level of science. So without wasting much time, I now hand over the platform to Dr. Namrata Madam to invite Dr. Rao to deliver his address. Sir, it would be our pleasure. We remember in January 2020, you were there with us addressing to uh, the young minds of 11th and 12th standard students. Now it's our students who are just uh, uh, 12th pass. They have entered their graduation, uh, undergraduation uh, journey. As well, we have PG students. So that is the profile of the crowd okay. today. Okay. Yeah. And we are pleased to announce that Dr. Kinneri uh, Dubal has also joined. So we welcome her also. Thank you, sir. Over to you, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Uh Well, uh, am I audible now? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, there was a little slight uh, probably misunderstanding uh, because when I was uh, trying to find out who will be the audience for this talk, uh, I was under the impression that some of them will be 10 plus 2 and some will be graduate students and some may be a higher level. So I was uh, uh, sort of addressing the very young people, uh, 10 plus 2 people, uh, plus, of course, will go as we go to BSc level, other level. And also I talk about some of my research. The purpose, of course, uh, for, for, for the very young people, it is an initiation of science. And for the other people who already know a lot of it, which I'm going to talk about, it will be refreshing. And uh, there will be some of advanced science for, uh, for, for uh, people who are at the higher level. Okay. Let, me, let me just start my, my general talk. We are talking about science. Then what is science? Uh, again, for the general kids, particularly very young kids, this is what is very important to grasp what we are now dealing with. What we are dealing with is science. How the science starts? Science starts only with observation. You need to observe the surroundings, observe parameters, observe something. Like I mentioned in, a, in one of the earlier meetings, a lecture related for you people, you observe the animals, uh, observe the nature, and then you find something. That observation, you analyze. When you analyze, you will try to understand that why that is happening or how that is happening, and you draw some inference. Based on inference, you will also create a hypothesis that, okay, this must be happening like this. That's your hypothesis. But having hypothesis itself is not sufficient. You have to do experiment to see whether that hypothesis is correct or not. So once you do the experiment, experiment results may support what you are thinking, or they may not support what you are thinking. In the light of experiment result, we revise our hypothesis. Once we revise, once we carry it to experiments, when we get some information, then we, okay, we decide something is correct, then we validate by independent methods. Once you validate, then it becomes a part of proven evidence-based scientific knowledge. Still, that knowledge is not uh, written on stone. It is stand, it can be corrected with time. In future, some, some more results may come, which may be changed. So science is all about seeing things seeing the world, seeing and observation. So that is what the science is. Now let us see what are the issues with the seeing. Now seeing is so simple. Now, for example, what are a lot of young children here sitting there maybe might have already seen this. For example, there are two lines, one line on the top, one line on the below. Now, which line looks longer? Okay, I'm sure you know this optical illusion experiment. You know what it is. You know the answer that both the lines are exactly identical in size, but it looks like that it is small. This looks like it is a short longer. But if you know, if you do, if you measure it exactly, that 3.6 centimeters. When I draw on the paper, it was 3.6 centimeters exactly. So it means seeing is not alone sufficient. You need to do quantification. So science depends on seeing things one, then quantification. You have to measure them. Unless you measure, it won't be really useful. So you have to have seeing, observation, and quantification. But long, longer years ago, very early years ago, people were only observing, thinking, and drawing conclusions, the reasoning, like armchair, sit on a chair and think of it. So like just observation and thinking about can lead to misunderstandings. There are many misunderstandings like that happened in the history of science. I want to quote two examples of history of science where just observation alone and interpretation was not to be correct. Then science developed further. Now, for example, how did the life begin? 
This question, how did the life begin, was asked by every community, every culture, Chinese, Indians, Greek, every person, every ancient civilization asked this question, how did the life begin on the planet? Okay. You now we know that about 4.6 billion years ago, Earth came into existence. It was so hot, so hot and boiling with the, with the liquids and metals, liquids and things, that it's a completely inhospitable condition. There is no way any organism, any life could have existed on that. But later on, all organisms came in. How did they come? That's a very important unknown question. Okay. Those days, about thousands of years ago, hundreds of years ago, people were thinking. Now, before mid 17th century, most people believe that the insects, frogs, small creatures are arising spontaneously out of mud or decaying matter, which you understand. If you see a cow dung somewhere left out, there may be some, some small insects coming out of it. So by observing that, some people thought that life originates from mud or decaying material. That was suggested not by any simple person, but that was suggested by Aristotle. Aristotle said that the life normally originates spontaneously from a mud or decaying material. That's not correct, we know. Not only that, he went ahead and made a very fantastic suggestion. His suggestion was, if there's a tree near the bank of a river, Okay. If the leaves fall in the river, they will become fish. If the leaves fall on the ground, they will become ducks. Okay. This is Aristotle. This is, a, this is documented evidence is there that Aristotle stated this. Now we know for certain that a leaf falling into the water will never become fish and leaf falling on the ground will never become a duck. But these suggestions were made because only thinking was there, no experimentation was there at the time. So that was a misleading situation. That's one thing. Let's go and see another example. This example actually largely for high school students. Uh, this example, we have two huge balls, one very big ball, but one small metal balls. If I drop both the balls from a very high distance, which will fall first? Obviously, the bigger one will fall first, smaller one will fall uh, slower. Okay, that's what one would expect. And no other than the Aristotle stated that the said that the heavy object should fall noticeably faster than the lighter object. So that was his expectation. We, we would understand that is his expectation. But for some, un, some unknown reasons, nobody tested this. So experimental science did not come up, develop at the time. Okay? It is Galileo, after long years, Galileo who thought we should test this. Okay? Now, where did he test? Again, you know from your school books, he went to Leading Tower of Pisa. The Leading Tower of Pisa, whether you can, you can climb up, you can climb up here, and then drop big stone, big uh, ball and a small ball together and see which drops to the ground at the same, at the time. And fortunately for him, both dropped at the same time. So he said that what Aristotle said is not correct. Okay. Now that observation again is not correct. So we have two observations which are seem to be incorrect. So that he has done it. It is very nice. But you know, that is actually what is what Galileo did is also not completely correct. Let's see what, uh, what it is. Now, if I, I can do the same Aristotle's experiment, Galileo experiment once again today. Okay. Now let us let us see this is an example done somewhere else in the United States. Now we'll drop a ball and a feather. Okay. They're heavy and light. We we'll drop them. So now ball came first. My feather is still coming. So what happened? One lighter and when heavy, we dropped at the same time. But a heavy one came first and a lighter one came much later. So Who's Galileo correct or Aristotle correct? What's the problem? The problem here is obviously is the air resistance. Okay. In addition to this general principle, air resistance plays a role. So you have to do this experiment in vacuum. If you do the experiment in vacuum, you will succeed. So now we can't do the experiment in vacuum, such a simple thing, but the people like NASA can do that. And so then they built, they did this experiment in NASA laboratory. So in NASA laboratory, they closed the gates. They closed this uh, chamber and created an extreme vacuum inside. So you can see the mechanical, then dropped both of them. You see now exactly ball and the feather come to the same level. They are moving at the same level. Okay? And they will reach the ground at the same level. So it means now if you do under the vacuum, this works, not really outside as a Galileo did in, in this thing. For Galileo it worked because it's a big stone. There was not much of resistance. So some of this fortunate uh, again. So like this, the science goes by observation, measurement, experiment, 
can go back to the data and modify your observations and inferences and theories. So that's how the science should, should, should go. Okay. Now, well, let's come back to how did life began because we're talking about biology. Okay. Now, how did the life begin? Again, the question. Now, we know uh, it is not from powder, but we know that at that time of the very hot conditions, atmosphere had nitrogen, water vapors, methane, ammonia, these gases were present on the, on the, on the Earth's surface. These are chemical species present. In addition, there was a radiation coming from cosmic. Cosmic radiation was coming into the onto the Earth. UV light was coming because there was no ultraviolet, the ozone protection was not there. Ozone is not there yet. Because ozone is not there, UV was coming in. So you have UV light. Because the raining was there, massive raining was there. So thunders and lightning was there. So lightning energy was there. And heat is there because the surface of the Earth was hot. So you have heat energy, electrical energy, photo energy, light energy, and cosmic energy. These energies are available, these molecules are available. So something might have happened among these things to create life, but that is a possibility. We cannot even do experiment, but that's a possibility. Now, again, the school experiments you might have studied. Miller and Urey did this experiment. You take a water and boil the water. So if steam, water vapor keeps coming in, here you put gases, methane gas, nitrogen gas, whatever gases which we thought were present, you put the gases here and put two electrodes and give electric discharge. This is like a lightning. So you have a lightning, you have gases, you have water vapor. So you created primitive earth condition and then wait for it. How long you wait? You wait for days together, weeks together. Okay. So this steam will come down, condense and come down again, again go up, keep doing. So keep doing for about days together, weeks together. Then find out in this water, anything else is there. Any other compound has come. When they did that, this water contained few amino acids, few nucleotides. Okay, it means these nucleotides, these amino acids must have been primordial molecules which must have created life on the earth. Okay, but the molecules for themselves cannot really make life, so they need to be put into the pocket, into a, into a bag, into a cell. So, how did the bag came? Most likely, the oil like molecules, if you put oil on the water and shake it, it forms a droplets. So, these droplets can create a cell membrane, and all these molecules have gone into the droplet and might have created a first living biological cell. So life might have originated by this method. So it means two of mistakes that were suggested, now we know that they are not correct, we know some answer. Not that it's a full answer, yes, it's a much better answer right now. Right now. Okay. Now that single cell, what might have come of all this situation, might have changed its shape depending on many conditions, might have developed a tail or not developed something also. But they must be living single. single. That's why we call them unicellular organisms. So they were all, initial cells were all unicellular organisms. They're just surviving somehow. But they learned that if they come together and stick together, they can avoid the toxic environment. If they come together, sit together, they can avoid a little bit of damage, so they will be comfortable. They'll be more safer if they're in groups. So they started coming together, living in a colony. When they started living in colony, they started organizing themselves. So when they organize, they are outer layer, inner layer, some kind of organization. When organization starts coming in, then you have a division of labor. First part of you do some activity, second part of you do some other activity. Okay, some kind of a division of labor is possible. When the division of labor is possible, you can have head and tail. Okay, now this actually this invaginated, it gone inside a little bit and created some kind of a shapes, original multicellular shapes. Now these shapes are eventually become like this. This is the opening mouth and there's the tail portion of it. These kind of shapes, slowly evolved, evolved with various conditions. There were tails, there were other parts of it, and, were, and they become marsupials and reptiles, things like that. And then, of course, they grow up to apes. And these apes are the ones which eventually started standing on two legs, and they become Homo erectus, like we are. Now, so from the very hot planet Earth, we are now basically understood are basically guessed to some great extent by Darwin's uh, ideas that we must have evolved from this and we are now becoming erectus. But this is the phenomenological observation. Molecular level, things are not very yet clear. Whatever the molecular level, let's see something about molecular level. Human tissues are all made by cells. You know, all biological cells will come together to form a tissue, like muscle tissue, skin tissue, hair tissue. These are all formed by cells. 
Now, we know each cell has a nucleus and each nucleus has chromosomes that red color are multiple colored things called chromosomes, colored bodies. These chromosomes are made up of DNA largely and proteins. DNA proteins together make, make chromosomes. So these are DNA proteins are most important biological molecules. Now, now DNA makes a copy of mRNA that we know of the coding region only. Of course, it can make for us non-coding regions also. It makes an mRNA. This mRNA makes proteins. If you change the DNA sequence, mRNA sequence will change, the protein sequence will change. So a large number of proteins can be made. These changes in sequences will create life forms, variation in the life forms. Multiple variations are possible by changing the sequence in DNA, changing the RNA, then protein sequence. For example, a large tree or a beautiful butterfly or a fungi or a large giraffe or a human being or a full human being are nothing but sequence variation. Between giraffe and between the woman, the difference is only sequence variation. So as sequence varies, things change. Now, if this is so critical, sequence must be very important. So we must understand how to sequence and how to go about it. Okay, but to understand the sequence, you should know the DNA structure. So DNA structure was, was initially found by Francis Crick and Jim Watson. And is, as you know, it's a double helical structure. Actually, the sugar moieties are linked by phosphate. And on this, you have nucleotides attached. And this is one strand and your two strands together, they make up the link. And now these will code for amino acids, proteins. Like if it's a double helical structure, now you say G, C, A like that each nucleotide is each base is attached here. If you have a G and C and A, G, C, A, that means it must bring an alanine. We will not go into the detail because I talked about it somewhere else uh, recently. Now, this alanine, tRNA is brought and alanine is put here. And like next codon is A, G, A, 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 G, A. A, G, A, if you see, then it will be RGB. It means on this, there's a code. On DNA, there's a code. If you take the code, you will make amino acid code. This amino acid code will make proteins. That's all is about DNA. Okay. Now let us move to protein part. Of it. Now, earlier in my talk, I talked more about DNA. This time I want to talk about proteins. Okay. Let us say what about the proteins. Proteins are very, very important molecules. They help DNA to replicate. DNA replication process involves polymerases and enzymes, which are proteins. So genetic information is preserved not only by DNA, but by proteins, because proteins help DNA to replicate. Also, they regulate their own synthesis on DNA template. On DNA, if a protein has to be synthesized, there's a ribosome, there's a process. That is controlled by proteins again. And proteins carry out all activities of life. If you eat your food, food is digested by enzymes. Okay. If when I'm moving my arms, my arms are moved by actin, myosin, all fibers. So whatever you think of as a biological and life activity, it is carried out by proteins. And in addition to that, interestingly, they organize their own degradation. Proteins, when they don't want the body, they have to be taken away. Who will take the protein away? Proteolytic enzymes will break it down. It means that itself, protein will degrade itself. It means the proteins are doing Brahma, Vishnu, Maheshwara, all three activities. They create, they maintain, they destroy. So proteins are most critical molecules of all life. And what do they do? They do enzyme activity. They do transport, for example, oxygen transporting storage of iron storage by ferritin, structure, collagen, like for example, beautiful skin or a bad skin or all these things, depends on the collagen. So your structure, your contraction, your protection antibodies and hormones, toxins, most of them are proteins. So proteins are very critical. Now, how, how are these proteins made in the, in the living cell? We said RNA, DNA makes proteins. So from DNA, you have to make RNA, RNA has to make a protein. It's a simple clip where we can see how this process happens. Now this is a biological cell. Okay, in the biological cell you have a nucleus. Okay, one big nice nucleus. Nucleus has chromosomes that we talked talked about. This each chromosome is made up of proteins and nucleic acid or DNA. This DNA frame is there. Actually, each human cell will contain five feet long DNA. Imagine five feet long DNA. Even person, some of them are not even five feet, okay? But each, each cell will have five feet long DNA. It has to pack very closely and pack inside the cell it is there. And as we know, it is a double helical DNA. When there's an enzyme, one enzyme comes, then that enzyme binds to this DNA and unwinds the DNA. It's like, it was a wind DNA, double helical, it unwinds. 
after unwinds, it unzips like a zip. It unzips. When it's unzipped, single stranded DNA is made and the nucleotides are exposed. Bound nucleotides, satisfied nucleotides are exposed. Because they're exposed, they're available for binding. They're available for binding for anybody. Now, in the solution, in the, in the living cell, there are nucleotides, free phosphodiets, nucleotides are present. These nucleotides diffuse. As a diffusion, diffusion of physical biophysical phenomenon, they keep on moving. There is no force. But when they come nearer, if the hydrogen bonding is proper, then they bind. Then they bind and make a copy of it, make a complementary copy of it. Okay, if it's A, T will be joined. If it's T, G will be joined. Like that, there will be complementary copy will be made. This what is being made is an mRNA. So like that, one mRNA is made. That mRNA which is made inside the nucleus will have to come out to the nucleus into the cell. So now it slowly comes out of the cell. Okay. Now when this comes out of the cell, it has to find a ribosome, a protein, protein synthesis machinery. Then ribosome, the mRNA binds to ribosome. On this, you have codons. So the tRNA brings up amino acid based on the codon match. With these codons match, one amino acid is kept here and brought it here. The next tRNA comes. And then these are matching, then they bind here, and these two can be linked. These amino acids are linked. The next amino acid will be, will be linked, and next amino acid will be linked, and then you maintain a sequence of protein. This beautiful video is a very simple video. This simple video was made by National Institute of Health USA several years ago before genome sequence was formed. Because, because genome sequencing project required huge amount of money. That money has to come from Congress, from the Parliament, or from the Senate. So Senate people have to understand what it is. So they made this video clip and they showed to Senate people so that, okay, they understand what is the process. So I had, I always use this so that people will understand very easily how, how the protein synthesis takes place. Okay, that's how it was funded and then genome sequencing was done later on. Okay, now proteins are beautiful molecules. Okay, you can, what, what you can see here, they have some helical structures, some beta sheet structures, some random coil structures. They keep on moving. Okay, they keep on they, they can keep on doing a lot of functions because of the structure. Now, structure of protein is very, very critical because just imagine your car tires are circular. If you have a square tires, your car is not going to move. Obviously, structure makes a difference. Structure is important for function. Now, these structures, how do they attain the structure? Or nice structures, we do not know because DNA is only one sequence. mRNA is also just one particular sequence. The proteins which are made, just a link of amino acids. These link of amino acids must attain these beautiful shapes. How do they attain these shapes? We do not know. That is what is called a protein folding problem. How a one-dimensional sequence information directs protein folding to correct functional three-dimensional structure. This has been my area of research activity for years. We've been working on various methods of it. There are model systems available, pathways are available. But in addition, the recently, last 10, 15 years also, idea of Molecular chaperones came in. It means the proteins do not fold by themselves. There is some other molecule. There are some other systems which will help protein to fold. Those are called heat shock proteins and small molecule and molecular chaperones. Again, this heat shock protein idea came very interestingly and unexpectedly. Uh, how it happened? You know, this is the hot spring. We know hot springs temperature will be about 75 to 80 degrees temperature, sometimes even 90 degrees temperature. So what do we assume normally? About 90 degrees temperature, there will be no bacteria. Nothing will leave. We put our food inside the fridge and believe that no bacteria grows in the fridge. Of course, it does grow. Likewise, we put in 90 degrees water and we believe that no bacteria grows. Well, that is not correct. We know that there is a thermophilic bacteria which can grow at high temperature. Take one thermophilic bacteria, for example, which grows at 68 degrees. 68 degrees is a very good temperature for it to grow. Take the thermophilic bacteria and suddenly take them to 92 degrees. If you take them to 92 degrees, all of them just die because you are giving a high heat. But first 68 degrees, take to 88 degrees, keep them in 88 degrees for some time, then take to 90 degrees. If you do that, they all survive. How, what happened? When you take to 68 to 88, it acclimatized. How acclimatized? It produced some proteins. Those thermophilic factors it produced, those factors it made it survive. This is actually the idea of heat shock protein. Uh, but this heat shock was not discovered in this fashion. It was discovered in a beautiful error fashion. Oh, okay, I probably don't have that slide here, but it was discovered by a, uh, by a student's mistake. A student thermostat by mistake, they changed. And because it's changed, then suddenly RNA puffing came in, heat shock proteins came in, alpha crystalline came in, all these things came. Okay. Now, what do these heat shock proteins do? 
when they come, how do they protect the cell from, from dying? So we do not know exactly, but what we understanding is that in a crowded cellular cell is very small. In a small cell, there are so many proteins. Because, because there are so many proteins, there's a crowding. Because there's a crowding, the new protein or molecule which is coming out doesn't have enough time to fold correctly. It may misaggregate. It may misaggregate cause problems. There's not enough space, not enough time. So that these heat shock proteins must protect the pro proteins before they go bad by aggregation. Now, we've, we have done this experiment in 1992, uh, where we take a protein, some protein, and heat a protein and cool it. When you take a protein, heat and cool, when you heat it, denatures, opens out, and hydrophobic radius are exposed. Then they stick together from aggregation. So normally, when you take a protein, heat and cool, it precipitates and becomes aggregated. So now in this cuvette, we see aggregated protein. We are seeing the protein because I put a laser light, laser pointer. You put a laser pointer here, light is scattering, you can see all this. Thing. This we did. The next experiment, we took the same protein, but we added some amount of heat shock protein. That is alpha crystalline that we have been working. We added a little bit of alpha crystalline and did the experiment again, heated and cooled. And then you see, the next time, there is no scattering whatsoever. So light beam goes nicely, absolutely no transistor scattering at all. So it's actually a, 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 an indication of this cataract condition, this the normal vision condition. So these proteins are preventing protein aggregation dramatically even under heat conditions. So that was the one which this segment we did in 1992 and published paper in 1994. Okay. So now, after 2000, we know human genome has 10 small heat shock proteins, okay? uh, which are all have sequence homology things. That are, now we are working about seven of them. Okay. Now my laboratory has now moved from different, different areas from biophysical, as Dr. Yadav was mentioning, I was a chemist to start with. So I worked on petroleum crack and catalyst to start with, and photoacoustic spectroscopy and photochemistry of solid state. From there, I, my laboratory slowly moved to molecular chaperones and small heat shock proteins in health and disease. That became my major topic. Now we work with the lens proteins because the alpha crystalline that I talked about came from eye lens. So in the lens proteins, that what I'm seeing, whatever you're seeing here is a human eye lens. How do I get a human eye lens? You can't take out lens from a human being. So this is an accident. When a person dies in an accident or someplace, you can take out the eye for some reason, then you can use the lens. This is a human eye lens. You put on the wire gauge. So you can see how human lens is very transparent, beautifully transparent and clear. Okay? But this is a younger person. But if you age, if you are 70, 65, 70 years old, then that becomes a little darker because some photochemical changes are there, plus proteins are aggregating. So your vision will be a little compromised. This is what leads to cataract with time. So these proteins we investigated. And if the lens becomes attractuous, you will see the world like this. When you are young, you see the world like this. You become old, it will see like this. But now when you see like this, you can remove the cataract, put a plastic lens, then everything is fine. Okay, That's what we have, we have done in the lens research. And then we work with something called prion protein. You must have heard mad cow disease. In the mad cow disease also, the small heat shock proteins play a role, which we did. And then Alzheimer's disease. You remember Alzheimer's disease where the people lose memory. They forget everything. There's a lot of confusion in the life. That happens because a protein called A beta peptide aggregates inside the brain and causes problems. So this is A beta aggregation. But if I have small heat shock proteins, that one which I talked about, the aggregation can be stopped. Okay? So that is one advantage. Then something else called uh, alpha synuclein, which causes Parkinson's disease. People keep on shaking hands. That can have a Parkinson's disease also. Alpha has a role. And beta 2 microglobin is a dialysis related disease. That also we have role. And something called HSP33, which is not a human protein, it's a bacterial protein, but it gave us a tremendous understanding. We did a lot of work on it, X-ray diffraction studies, following X-ray diffraction studies, all of them we did on that. But, but we'll not talk about that because it's a bacterial protein, not a human protein. Then another protein called heat shock protein 22. This was identified by the sequence by other people, but we don't know whether it is heat expressed or not whether it is really heat shock protein or not. So we showed by mRNA, messenger RNA expression levels that it is actually a heat shock protein. Then we worked with, uh, of course, the story we started with alpha crystalline. Alpha crystalline has been a major source of activity for our laboratory. It, it does many, many, many things. So that's a, we must have published large number of papers in alpha crystalline and led this research to a great extent. Now, we also worked with some other proteins we'll just skip. What this small heat shock protein alpha crystalline plays a role it plays a role in stress response in survival. For example, if the temperature is increased, 
cell will shut down all the activities. It will not produce DNA, it will not produce RNA, it will not produce any other protein. Everything stops, but it produces heat shock proteins because it's necessary for it to survive. So stress response, then cardiomyopathy, human heart problem. In cardiomyopathy, they help. In amyloid disease, like uh, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, it helps. Then cell circuit regulation, how cell has to regress, cell division has to start, how it has to stop, it will regulate. Apoptosis, apoptosis is a process in, by which cells kill themselves, okay? Uh, when required, cells have to be killed by themselves. That process, apoptosis is also controlled by alpha crystalline and cancer because cell cycle and apoptosis, both are controlled, both are necessary in cancer condition. So this molecule that work, we work with also has a role in cancer and we, loss of this activity of this protein can cause diseases. So we engineered molecules, which will have high activity, seven to seven to eight fold activity. I will not talk about that now. It's a, it's a very big activity. We created some seven different molecules, which are, which are called uh, domain swap molecules, but engineered molecules. Those molecules have six to seven fold more activity than the wild type molecules, so that they may be useful therapeutically. We don't know, but they may be useful therapeutically. Okay, one example I show for the children, for the younger people to see how this kind of research can be done. Now, this is, a, we grow a cancer cells in a petri dish. Many of you know petri dish is like a small plate. On the plate, we grow the cells. When you grow the cells on the lawn, they become all fully covered like a lawn. Take a pin and get, dry line, you scratch it. When you scratch it, in a scratch area, you call the damage, cells are broken, there are no cells. So this is a scratch. This big thing, whatever you think is a scratch, because the microscope is a big, it's a big thing scratch. This side living cells are there, this side living cells are there, there is a scratch. Normally what the wound heals, by the cells will divide and come back and close. These cells will come back and close the wound. So that's called wound healing. Now, if you take a cancer cells, if you normal cells, wound heals like that. In the cancer cells, not that they won't heal, but they don't stop. They grow and cause a tumor. They will never know that wound is healed, I must stop. They will not realize that. They keep growing and big, they become big. One problem with the cancer is they also go to different places, metastasis. One place to other place they go. Now we worked on a, on a, on a heat shock protein. If you block that heat shock protein, cells will not move. Cells, wherever they are there, they'll move so that metastasis can be minimized. Now how we do that experiment, you see, now we put a scratch and allow the cells to grow. Okay. Now we did the same with the cancer cells also, with, with all our protein. Now you see cells are dividing, dividing and they're moving together. Okay. You can see the cells are dividing and coming together, coming together and they're blocked. So they completely heal the situation. But here you look at the thing, cells are moving, but they're not able to catch, the, they're not able to close it. It means the cells lost the ability to move. Mobility has com compromised. Because the mobility is compromised, these cancer cells will remain at one place. They will not go and metastatize. One cancer, primary cancer will not go to next cancer. So you can, when you are teaching, treating a cancer patient, you give these molecules along with that, metastasis can be prevented. That's a beautiful way one can think of it. And uh, this can be, although here in your pictures we can visualize, but you can actually trace each cell, how far each cell has moved. By confocal microscopy will give you the pictures. You can see how long each cells move. Control cells move like this, but the other cells which we put molecule, they do not move much. So that's an advantage, okay? Now let us change gears and ask you some simple questions. Everybody asks this question, how do we age and die? Why do we die? Why should we die? We, why we can't live continuously? That's a question. Now very young people, very young, two, three year old people, they want to grow up very hurry. I want to go up. Everybody is three year boy, you ask, what is your age? You'll take four, four years. As 10 years boy, you ask, you said 11 or 12 years. He's very eager to grow. But if you ask 25 year old person, you say you're 24 years old because he doesn't want to grow. Okay. But why this happens? What is this, this thing? Now, there's a chemistry and physics and biology. From chemistry and physics point of view, why do we die? Because we get oxidized. Just simply we get oxidized. Our living systems are reduced condition. If you have NADPH, NADH, all our body functions depend on oxidation. Uh, on a reduced condition, if you are oxidized, you die. Okay, oxidation is a process which slowly takes us to zero level. And another thing is increase, increase in entropy. The physical, biophysical, the physical problem, physical issue is that everything in the universe, entropy keeps on increasing indefinitely in only one direction. There is no change. Entropy has to increase. Now we are organized. Amino acids which are free are put together to make a protein. It means that entropy decreased. 
their free will decrease. Now they have put in the cell, the cells are better to tissue. And so your entropy is decreasing and decreasing. So a human being, you have entropy in very low level entropy. You randomize it. You kill the person, let the bacteria go away, let DNA go away. That is randomization. So these two biophysical chemistry and physics tells you that you are oxidized, your entropy increases, that's how you die. Okay. Now what does biology say? Biology says failure of repair mechanisms. When you are young, if something goes wrong, there's a mechanism to repair it. That repair system fails as you age. For example, in a younger age, if you have a scratch or if any, uh, any injury, it, it clears, you have no mark, nothing left on. But older age, it doesn't happen. It stays. Okay, the repair mechanisms fail. The failure of repair is an error accumulation. Error accumulation means some DNA got changed. Earlier it would have been corrected, but is now not corrected. So the error is remaining. So you keep on making more errors. Errors accumulate and accumulate and accumulate. Once error is too many to be taken care, then you have to die. Another reason is chaperones, molecular chaperones. When I said molecular chaperones help the proteins, if a protein is going bad, molecular chaperone helps it. Now, with age, molecular chaperones also start failing. When they start failing, there's nobody to take care of proteins. So proteostatis, what we call proteostatis, proteostatis will start failing. When proteostatis starts failing, then you eventually die. So we die because of the failure mechanism. And one more important reason to die is shortening of telomere. Each biological cell has a DNA, and in the DNA are two ends of DNA called telomeres. Whenever cell divides, small part of telomere gets lost. Because telomere is going away, each time telomere gives away, one division, second division, third division, as you go, telomere becomes smaller and smaller, you will not be able to survive. Okay. So telomere shortening is one of the reasons. Now, I put the picture of car here to see, your grandfather or great-grandfather may have an ambassador car, let's say. That ambassador car, if tires are gone bad, you replace the tires. Okay? If engine has some problem, carburetor is bad, you replace the carburetor. If engine is bad, you repair engine. If bore is bad, you repair the rebore the engine. If engine is bad, you replace the engine. But your car is never thrown. You keep on adding things, but car is continuously used. Is it not? That way, we must be able to use ourselves. We must be able to replace components. Replace components, we must be continuously living. That is the idea that now people are talking about. So what we need to do, because of oxidation is a problem, we must have antioxidants. Our food should have antioxidants, increase antioxidants. Anti-inflammation. Inflammation is something which really bothers us. We have to have anti-inflammatory molecules. Then you need to have physical activity. If you don't have physical activity, no use, you lose. Okay. Then organ replacement by 3D engineering telomeres. You can make a 3D structures. You can make a 3D, if liver is bad, make a 3D liver and that liver can be 3D printing liver that can be put back. So it means you are replacing carburetor, you are putting engine. So like that, you must be able to live continuously. And telomeres, because telomeres are going away, we can take a cell nucleus and by CRISPR-Cas methods, other techniques like that, we can add telomeres. If you add a long telomere and put these cells back into the person, it means those cells should not die. For example, take a liver cells, add telomere, injury telomere and put them back, they may survive. But the danger is telomere, if it doesn't go, they can become cancerous. Okay, One has to worry about that aspect of it. That's a possibility. And uh, I think I'll go a little faster now. And now we looked at the under, under living, living life expectancy conditions, we looked at our protein, alpha-crystalline protein. If you take a fly, drosophila fly, and put alpha-crystalline into, into that by transgenic method. So we made a transgenic flies, transgenic drosophila, which are expressing alpha B crystal. Normal fly will live up to about 55 days. Okay. But if I express alpha B crystalline in that fly, that lives up to 80 days. Now you see 55 to 60 days, now increased to 80 days. It means his lifespan is increased just by putting alpha crystalline in the fly. It means alpha crystal is protecting all oxidative damages, all these damages, and helping the fly live long. That's beautiful. Nice, of course, people have shown, we have shown it, and other people also shown that such molecules can extend life in zebra fish and other, other model systems. Okay. Now we also looked at the stress conditions, and I'm not going to these details. And we looked at the different neurons, motor neurons, dopamine neurons, fat body, other things. We learned quick. Come to Alzheimer's disease. In Alzheimer's disease, aggregation takes place and people forget and things like that. We can put the model A beta peptide FP express in the fly, in the Drosophila fly model. The fly model, you can see that there's a damage in the fly. Okay, 
this is a normal fly. This is a normal fly I. Again, some of you studied biology. Fly has a omatidia. The eye is a composite eye. The composite, this is, this is a composite, whole thing is a composite eye. Each dot is an omatidia. This omatidia is very, very nice and beautiful. This is a normal picture, this electron microscope. Now, if you put that transgenically, A beta peptide, which causes Alzheimer's disease, you see this. All the omatidia gone bad, they're very dirty, so everything mixed up. And you can see an EM picture is very bad. Compared to this, it's very bad. But along with that, I put alpha beta stain also, excessive. then it becomes all right. So compared to this, this is better. Okay, So it is able to help, not really treat, no treatment, but a little bit help in terms of a, the Alzheimer's disease. Now, this is another beautiful experiment where cognitive function can be seen. When Alzheimer's, when Alzheimer's uh, disease is there, people also don't move much. Their mobility also decreases. They will be dull and uh, sitting there and don't do anything, things like that. So we expressed alpha B, uh, alpha B we expressed uh, uh, Alzheimer's peptide, A beta peptide in, in the flies, you know, in a in a drosophila, and also expressed alpha B along with the disease causing mutant and see how nicely they behave. These are the two test tubes. We, we put some drosophila flies inside, inside this, the fruit fly, fruit flies inside and seal with that cellotape here. And, and all of them we have put. These are the normal, nothing is the normal drosophila flies. These flies are the ones, said middle ones, are the ones which have a disease, Alzheimer's disease. We create Alzheimer's disease by transgenic. This one are trans the Alzheimer's disease flies, same flies as this, but they also have some alpha crystalline. And we see how do they behave. Now, what is the behavior? It's something called negative geotropism. Means if you take that fly and tap it, if you tap it, all the flies will fall down. When they fall down, they want to climb up. Normal ones will climb up. Okay. Now we'll just show you, I'll show you this experiment. Now you have taken them and tap it. Okay, if you see if you tap it, all the flies are at the bottom. The flies are all at the bottom. Now these flies are climbing up. Normal flies are going up. Okay. Now the Algemas flies, see, all Algemas flies are sitting there. And just one or two are trying to go, all of them are sitting here. But the ones with alpha crystalline gone up. See, this already has gone up to this level. Okay. Now alpha crystalline is helping them to move. So their mortality is restrained. This is coming back. We can just see once again. See, these are the we are tapping. When we when we tap, all the flies are at the bottom. The normal flies quickly start going up. Normal flies quickly going up. The algebraic flies are sitting here. These flies have already started going up. Okay. So that is the way. So it means it is possible by protein chemistry, protein engineering, to treat species like Alzheimer's disease, expand lifespan. Many, many beautiful things are possible to be done. These are younger people have to do a lot more. Okay. Now, we can also plot the data in that terms. In the, in the normally, if you, you can also count how much distance they move. So, for example, normal ones will move about 11 centimeters, about 10 centimeters, 10 to 11 centimeters, the normal one will move. But Alzheimer's fellows will move only about three centimeters, three to three point five centimeters. But if you have alpha crystallite to them, they will go up to nine percent, nine centimeters. So there is a very good improvement is possible with this. Thing. This is all some of the basic work. I also done uh, application oriented work in the sense that quickly use your knowledge so that public gets benefited immediately. One thing is contribute to knowledge, global knowledge, so that everybody in the world can use that knowledge for furthering knowledge and expand the horizon of knowledge, okay? knowledge for the sake of knowledge. Okay? The other thing is that use that knowledge to solve the local problems, see whether we can help people by using that knowledge. So some of that, that, that spot up is not normally nowadays called translation research or translation effort. So we did few of them just now, uh, uh, in the beginning and in introduction time, they mentioned the DNA-based diagnostic that we developed, which has gone into market. And we developed, we are working in nanobiology, photodynamic therapy, retinoblastoma, microfluidics, all of them I cannot uh, discuss, but I'll just tell you what it is, is basically in few words. This is a DNA-based diagnostic that was talked about. Uh, maybe it's not here in this. So I'll tell you what it is. Major point is in India, many people get eye diseases, uh, when they get eye disease, eye infections, when they go to doctor, they will give some antibiotic. If it works, fine. If it doesn't work, they change antibiotic. In sometimes that uh, uh, there is some diseases where if you don't treat in three days, your eye is completely lost. You have to remove the eye. Okay? 
Now we thought, can we identify what bacteria causing the disease? Now we asked in India, all ophthalmologists in India, what bacteria they see in the patient's eye. We, we, we collected a list and we, we found out that there are about 20 bacteria which cause this. All these 20 bacteria, we identified a unique sequences by going to their gene sequence and we made primer sets for each unique of them. These primer sets are complexed, or multiplexed. When you multiplex primer complex, you must take care of many, many things. Cross, cross hybridization must be avoided. So many things are done. Temperature of uh, annealing has to be managed. All these things we manage. And then we develop the system. So that's how the system develops. And we, we can use color, luminescence, weight, resonance frequency, capacitance, any one of them to detect it. We, we developed a chip. I, I don't want to go into detail. It's a chip that we developed in the market. And now the chip is in the market. So people are now getting treated with this. And this chip also can be used for spinal cord infections, not only eye infections, spinal cord infections. So that's in the market. Now, it, 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 it only takes about five hours to do the test. Otherwise, test would take four days. So this takes about five hours and it's extraordinarily sensitive. It can detect one, one virus particle. If your body has one virus particle, it can still detect it. Okay. Now, change the gear about nanobiology. Nanobiology, for again, for younger people, there are two aspects of nanobiology. One is study biology at the nanoscale. Other one is use that knowledge to make devices at the nanoscale. Uh, one is study of the biological problem at nanoscale using different microscopic techniques and make the molecular devices using these approaches. Okay. Now, nanobiology can be used for medicine because I, my theme today has been medicine, so it can be used for medicine. One of the application is fungal keratitis that we did. Okay. What is the fungal keratitis? Is a bad disease. That's the eye normal, more or less normal eye. Now it can become like this. It is extremely bad. For whom it happens normally, if a farmer, when it's cutting the uh, reaping harvest, at the time the rice blade can touch the eye. If it touch the eye, some fungal spores can come onto the eye. When it happens, the farmer will not worry. He is busy harvesting. At the time, he will not do anything. After two, three days, eyes will start watering and red color eye watering will come. Then he will go to doctor. By the time fungus is sit on the parnia, on the eyelid. And then it doesn't go. It doesn't, it, what it does is that this is a fungus, it has to live, it has to put, it needs food. Where is the food? It produces proteolytic enzymes and breaks the cornea. Our cornea cells, it degrades and uses it for nutrition. Okay. Now, by the time doctor treats fungus, cornea is already damaged. If cornea is already damaged, your vision is compromised. So 30% of the farmers or 30% of our Indian people who go to the hospital will lose their sight permanently. They go blind. 30% of the people. Now, that's, that is what this can become so bad like this. Now, what is the challenge? Why, why are we not able to handle this? The main problem is blinking. So we keep on blinking eyes. When we blink, why do we blink eyes? Eyes blinking is like wipers or the car wipers. Okay, Whatever dust falls, it will clean away. It has enzymes also, lysozyme, things like that, which will kill the bacteria, things like that. So this is the purpose is to remove whatever is there. Now, if I give antifungal medicine to the person, to the patient, that antifungal medicine also will be removed by this. The medicine will not stay. Because medicine will not stay, effective concentration is not reached. So, fungus will not die. You need to keep on putting the drug every two hours or every one hour you have to keep on putting the drug, then only it can take. And farmer is not able to go and do that. So, it is the problem. Now, with, with, our, with the nanotechnology, can we hold the molecule on the cornea without going? Even if you blink, it should not go. Can you do that? Is the one which you tried. So what we need, we need to, what are the desired features of the gene? We, we need to increase the corneal residence time. It means it should not be washed away. Then it should have antimicrobial activity because it has to kill the fungus. It must have anti-inflammatory activity because when it is sitting on the cornea, body reacts by inflammation. So it must stop inflammation. Then it must protect the cornea from damage. It must have a condition responsiveness. These are the features that we want. Biological disease parameters are overexpression of tall like receptors. Any infection, tolerant receptors are expressed. Inflammation will increase. And uh, proteolase activity will also increase. And local pH will reduce. These are the biological features. We want to use these features, these features to create systems like this. So that's what we have done. And we developed a nano system. And this is the eye. If you think of this an eye, front of eye. This is a tear film. This is a tear film. This is a cornea. Okay? When the fungal particles come through tear film and attack the cornea, when they attack the cornea, body inflammation happens. 
all inflammatory systems will come up and try to kill this fungus, but they will not be able to. So they start causing damage all over this place. Okay. These proteolytic enzymes come and cause damage all over the place. Now the particle that we made is a nanoparticle, which is a protein-based nanoparticle, which has some, some something which will attach, which will anchor out to the system. And now if you allow this, this will come and anchor to the cornea. Once it anchors to cornea, even if you blink, it will not go. Then these proteolytic enzymes will go and break this protein because the protein is broken down. Then the antifungal compound will come and kill the fungus. Okay, this is this whole system. This system has several advantages, not normal, it's system advantages. One is this TLR4 receptors are there because of infection. When I add a reagent, my reagent, it binds to TLR4 reagent. Once TLR4 is burned, it is stops the inflammation because TLR4 is responsible for inflammation. Now this is blocked, so inflammation is decreased. So there's a damage to redness, eye, all these things are stopped, first thing. And second thing is, these protein enzymes will release fung antifungal drug. So it is happening. It is anti-inflammatory and antifungal. Both things are happening by same model, same model. Now we tested it. The normal animal, untreated animal, day one, it looks like that. If you allow the animal without any treatment, seven days it becomes like that. You see, you lose complete transparency of the lens, of the eye. You can't see anything. But with the, with the combination that we used, in the day one, you infect the fungi, even after infection, day seven, you see it's completely normal and clean. So there's no problem whatsoever. Okay? This is one thing which we have developed. Uh, these are special features of that. It increases the corneal residence time, suppresses the infiltration of neutrophils, vascularization is corneal epithelium is prevented, and corneal binding and inflammatory activity depends on the severity of infection. More infection, more uh, TLR force, more binding, and drug release depends on the protease activity. Most importantly, these nanoparticles are protein nanoparticles. So the fungi which needs food, they can eat this protein instead of eating corneal. So these particles act as alternate substrate. Because of they are not eating fungi, cornea, they are eating these particles. Then cornea is protected. So these are all the all the things that's coming and which which we published very nicely. We were very happy with that. Uh, this publication was got international attention. And uh, Chemistry World is a journal which published by Royal Society in UK, and they they wrote about this one. They saw that scientists in India have designed a nanoparticle based drug delivery system that binds to and uh, the surface of the eye and delivers anti drug. But the system is more than a carrier. It uses intricate array of cooperative effects, things like that. It demonstrates how our lateral thinking can be applied to generate new benefits. This is truly novel and potentially highly transparent. Lacking. Now, it is very nice to see that somebody from outside the country says that India developed something. In, in, most of the time, we say that UK developed this and uh, US developed that and in the, our newspapers. This is very nice to see that we are very pleased uh, with this success. Then we also tried <clears throat> something called photodynamic therapy. Considering the life, considering the time of it, I think I will not go more of that. Uh, I'll just show you one example of that. This is a cancer situation. What you see here is a cancer growth, small cancer growth. If you don't treat that and leave it alone, the cancer can become this big in 15 days' time, from here to here within 15 days' time. The second case, we again develop this cancer tumor here, that this tumor is here. For this tumor, we inject a photodynamic molecule that we prepared. It's called PDT, photodynamic therapy molecule. We inject it, not only inject it, we shine light on it. When you put light on it, the light gets excited, excites the molecules. Those molecules produce single toxin. That single toxin will kill the cancer cells. So we do this and again wait for 15 days and see there is no tumor whatsoever. So that this was a tumor earlier. Now there's no tumor whatsoever. So this photodynamic effect works dramatically in the cancer treatment, but only the surface cancers, not the deep cancers. That uh, this can be used for some other purpose as well. Okay, we will not go into these details of that. Then one last part is microfluidic, paper microfluidics. See what we need in our country is affordable, scalable diagnostics, which can be used by a person who is not well trained, also in the village. Because in the village, we cannot have a cold chain, we cannot have a refrigerator system, system, things like that. Without cold chain, a unskilled person must be able to use such diagnostics as to come. Those diagnostics will be only paper-based diagnostics. So we are developing paper-based diagnostics. For the school children who has not seen any paper diagnosis concept, this is the paper diagnosis concept, which is a small video. Here we made red lines. These are actually hydrophobic lines on a paper. We put some liquid here. When you put a liquid on a paper, it should go any, everywhere. But in this case, it goes only through the line that you put it. 
okay it is not spreading all over the place it goes only through the lines that you put in because these lines are put in by hydrophobic molecules but we make it so this is called uh, paper based micro channel systems okay micro paper based devices will be very useful in future you now we are developing we have developed one for the, for the summer student one of the summer student developed with us uh, blood grouping we can put up antibodies on this and we can measure we can identify which blood blood group the person belongs to by putting a drop of blood blood will diffuse to this side all three sides and bind to antibody and show the color whether which one is uh, which group it belongs to that we have done for the for the summer students to learn the techniques now we have developed a pregnancy detection kit for cattle and uh, we are down something called pecr that is on paper uh, electrostatic uh, electrostatic sedimentation rate method and we also developing for bio cardio biomarkers also we are developing this is a new concept that we are developing uh, Elisa, we're developing, we'll not go into details, we'll not go into details. So I'll want to stop it here. But the future of medicine, how the future of medicine will be, will be based on our biology? It will be individualized medicine. Earlier, one medicine was given for every purpose. For headache, one tablet you take. But now medicine will be individualized because of DNA sequencing. And uh, uh, we know exactly pharmacokinetics and pharmacogenomics. And AI based artificial intelligence based decisions. We can make a decision of a treatment based on artificial intelligence. That is now new area which is coming up very well. So the students should now pay attention on AI. Whatever you are studying, you may be studying geology, botany, chemistry, forget about it. Learn AI on an online class are available. Just learn AI because it will be your, going to be used for every aspect of your life. Driving the car onwards to treating cancer. Okay, you should learn AI based decision making. Nano encapsulated novel drug delivery system that I mentioned to you that's that is going to be useful. The nano robotic clinical process surgeries can be done by nano robotic systems, and cell based therapies and 3D printing of organs will come and gene therapy of course these are going to come. These are the newer things which are going to happen soon in in life, and uh, this is not very science fiction movie which is really going to happen. This picture what you see on the top is a is the aircraft designed by. Uh, by Wright Brothers in 1903. That is actual aircraft. This is there in American Museum, American uh, Space Museum, which I saw. This is my photograph that I have taken there. This is a real one. This one was built in December 1973, 1903, and it was tested flying. It 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 was about 10 feet above the ground, 10 feet above the ground, and 150 feet, 120 feet distance went and fell. Okay. Now, after 45, 50 years, man has gone to moon. Okay, climbing about 10 feet at one time and within 40 years, man has gone able to go to moon. It means science progresses dramatically, very fast. Now the progress rate is increased so much because of combination of biology, physics, chemistry, computer science, combination is enhancing the science, growth of rate of science dramatically. So the younger generation people now who are studying intermediate and BSc, MSc and PhD, we have a fabulous set of opportunity to make a major breakthrough and change the world. Uh, we have done, like people like Yadav or myself, we reach a certain age, we have done whatever we could. We are still doing, of course, we are still doing, but uh, but it is not the younger generation who has a greater challenges, greater opportunities, and this is a beautiful time to be in this age. And all the good uh, wishes for you, and uh, I'm, I'm sure that you all will make a great scientist. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Uh for uh, sharing your wisdom with our students. And uh, uh, there is actually uh, questions which are uh, popped up in the q and box. Three yes. questions are there, sir. Please. Uh, yeah. uh, with your permission. Yeah, please go ahead. The question is, what is the reason for dryness of ice? Yes. <clears throat> yeah. It's called dry ice syndrome. It's called dry ice syndrome. There's a lacrimal glands. Lacrimal glands will secrete uh, tear film onto tear onto the onto the eye. The lacrimal glands fails. Lacrimal gland fails to secrete the lacrimal fluid because that's not able to fluid. The uh, uh, dry uh, eye becomes dry, and when it becomes dry, when you are uh, uh, closing the eye, it becomes rubs. It rushes or rubs on it. That rubbing will cause pain, pain, and then it causes damage to cornea. So to avoid that, we can use artificial tears. When a dry eye is there. We have to use artificial tear drops. We have to use. There are no treatment. There is no cure. We have to use artificial tears. But artificial tears are different types. One or one or two types are liquid-like. When they put them, you have to use for maybe uh, once a day or twice a day. But there are some liquid-based ones out there. 
which we can put on the night, they will work for entire day. With one night you put in it, they work very well. So dryness is because the lacrimal gland fails to secrete the lacrimal fluid. That's the problem. Okay. Yeah. Uh, coming to the next question, which is raised by Kirti Bhatt, that has PDT worked for us human? I don't know what PDT stands for. Has PDT worked oh. for us? For us, for human beings. Yeah. Human beings, yeah. yeah, yeah. PDT is photodynamic therapy. Photodynamic therapy works for human beings. This experiment what I showed you is for animal experiment. But PDT has been used for uh, eye diseases already. For eye diseases, we can use. Uh, in eye diseases, wherever some uh, blood clots come up with the eye and all, we can put the PDT component and with the laser, the PDT the treatment is being happening. For the skin problem, skin cancer, other areas, PDTs can be tried. Now, PDT itself is not new. Photodynamic therapy is known for 10, 15, or 30 years. But the molecules, there are molecules. There are four companies in, in the world which make these PDT molecules. And two of them are world dominant. They are extremely costly. I will tell you the cost. 80,000 rupees per oil. 80,000 rupees per oil is the cost of it. Now, we prepared them by using regular chemistry, like... Uh, uh, like one of our CSL laboratory people have made a regular chemistry molecule. That molecule, we know what we need and we tested in our laboratory. This molecule is doing better than the FDA approved molecule in terms of penetration, in terms of uh, speed of this thing. And we already applied for patent. We got the patent for it. Uh, now we, we don't know whether we can find the world gen, but we got the patent for it. This molecule will cost probably 500 rupees. So that is 80,000 rupees per oil. Uh, but but of course, Dr. Yadav knows, laboratory and industry are very, very different. You can, from the laboratory to go to industry is, is a nightmare. Uh, somebody has to help us doing that. But yes, it, it works for human beings, yes. Uh, we are uh, fortunate to be connected with uh, Professor Nishit Desai, who has raised the question, can yes. you suggest any nano medicine? Can I suggest any nano medicine? Oh. Yeah, can you suggest any nano medicine? Well, uh, probably he is trying to ask the question whether any nanomedicine is actually available in the market other than research. Yes, one of them is uh, cancer treatment medicine. Okay, for cancer, the for the exact medicine uh, that is nano encapsulated, nano encapsulated. That is, uh, I'm now getting them not getting it. Is that is a regular cancer medicine, but that is nano encapsulated so that the doses can be minimized and uh, effectivity can be increased. That is one. And that tear film, that uh, uh, cornea film that we make, nanoparticle, this is available. In sense, it's not available to the market yet, but its formulation is available for testing in the clinical level. That is, that's available. And there are many nano uh, medicines available for painkillers. Painkiller nano medicines are available. And drug tracking or uh, image processing level, nano components are being used. And uh, there are one or more, yeah, one more case, spinal, spinal injury cases. In spinal injury cases, you can treat them with the stem cells. Okay. If spinal injury that you know that spinal injury happens, nothing happens. The person is dead on the on the bed for all the time, life. But now you can put stem cells on that and we can try to do it. But those stem cells are not surviving for some reason. Now, nano coated, nano encapsulated scaffolding, along with that, if you put it is working. It is not laboratory, it is surgical. Patient is getting treated with this in the world. Okay, even, even in India, there are people who are doing it. So this is this is one thing which is right now available. But still, the question is very valid, is that nano, there's a lot of hype. What exactly is coming in is the question. If you look at it, your, your washing machine drum is nano-coated. Washing machine drum is nano-silver coated so that bacteria gets killed. Your refrigerator is uh, nano-silver coated so that bacteria doesn't grow. Some of the dress material is nano-coated so that that doesn't crumple. Okay. These are already in the market. Okay, so Maybe a day will come, we'll have the coating of antivirus also. Yes. Uh, bacterial. <laughs> yes, it, 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 it will definitely come. Uh, yes. uh, the clothing with this antiviral clothing can come. Yes. Yeah. Sir, the uh, chat box as well as the question and box is buzzing with questions and compliments in the chat box. Uh, there are Dr. Amit Kumar Datta. In the meanwhile, I'll take the compliments we got. Uh, Meenal Patel also that it was wonderful webinar and uh, informative, knowledgeable session. Uh, and they have thanked uh, from Amity University, Jharkhand. So, sir, coming to the next question with your permission, uh, how can modern biology help to prevent marine pollution? Prevent marine? Marine pollution. Marine pollution. Well, yeah. see, biology, I don't know how it will help. Marine pollution has to be controlled by the, by the laws, legal procedures and things like that. 
but one of the marine is thinking that of the ships under the ship there is a foilage when the ship goes into there is a foilage that foilage is a problematic thing that foilage can be controlled by various uh, consortium of bacteria consortium of bacteria are now being developed to, to take care of the foilage that's one thing marine contaminant also because happens because of oil spillage see oil tankers will spill oil that spoils the marine food. that oil spillage can be again controlled by microorganisms and for the for the indian students exciting thing is that the indian scientists in the verma long time ago identified a bacteria can destroy oil destroy the oil so that oil spillage in the ocean can be controlled with the bacteria and he applied for a patent first time for a biological system patent was applied several years ago and of course it did not grant was not granted for some other reason but uh, it's indian who discovered that the oil can be eaten by the bacteria heat away oil will prevent the marine contamination because marine contamination one is the oil spillage okay this can be controlled but we dump plastic material into ocean uh, no biology can control only only the government ship control yeah that's right that is humans are the one who actually pollute yes. and we, we are the one we are the one and support. then we find the solution also that is something <laughs> irony yeah and the next question goes that what is the future of gene uh, modification yeah gene modification that's very interesting uh, question all these days we were believing that whatever genes we are inherited that's it once we inherit genes from our parents whatever good or bad is there it is there we cannot do anything with that we have to only suffer for it but if you know the sequence you will know what is likely problem coming in future so you can take care of it but with the crispr cas technology now with the crispr cas technology maybe it is possible to correct the gene even if you have inherited a bad gene from your parent you know that this is a bad gene inherited use the crispr technology to cut the gene and take it away and so that you can be cured of that gene disease so gene therapy genomic therapy or gene therapy with the crispr cas technology in future oh, crispr cas cas you know only last week on the nobel prize uh, uh, last week nobel prize was given for crispr technology if this technology really works we don't know whether it really works because 10 years ago we we thought that the genome genomic uh, putting a gene of requirement in the system gene therapy should work but it did not work it actually killed the patient so gene therapy even today is not really successful but with the crispr cas there is a possibility but the crispr cas will work first in the plants agriculture it will work because there is no problem you can work in the agriculture. then subsequently we may take it to human beings and i believe genome therapy in future with the crispr cas will such definitely succeed of course when i gave this such a lecture at, in, earlier in one place one girl stood up and asked me she is short she said short because of genetics can i become tall with the crispr <laughs> well well i i hope i i think it's not possible now <laughs> but maybe in future yes yeah sir uh, time is there and if we can afford two more questions yeah yeah no yeah. problem yeah. the question is from sonakshi shrivastava and uh, she says that my question is related to telomere shortening yeah. yes discussed in your presentation yeah. Yeah. how does telomere helps in aging of body and yeah. can it be controlled to a certain extent that it does not cause cancer yeah that's the very important aspect each cell when we have one cell it can divide into two three four it keep on keeps on dividing when it divides the end of it by a process of uh, uh, division some portion will be lost because you are starting at one point so each time telomere piece of it is going so first division the sum amount is the second division so as telomere is coming down and down eventually cell will not be able to divide any further it goes into senescence it dies this is it means almost you are putting a time timer timer into the cell with the timer is over your cell is going to die that is the condition now what we are saying is the timer we are always rotating timer we are always changing so the timer will never reach the end that's a point so we can keep on putting a telomere at the end we put it it should continue the cancer cells don't die they are immortalized they are immortalized because they will not allow the telomeres to go down they will keep on putting the telomere back okay that is why they will continue now we should be able to put the telomere but not use that enzyme that cancer uses cancer is an enzyme to extend the telomere we should not do that we should probably do it outside in the organ in the, in the laboratory condition cells should be grown these grown cells should be put back for example take a liver cells and uh, check the telomere add telomere in the liver cells let the cells stabilize and no other problem no telomere extension coming these cells if you put back they'll be younger cells so younger cells in the older uh, liver 
so these younger cells will divide and liver should become young okay if liver becomes young then you become young so the idea is that uh, older ones keep on replacing with time these are all almost like a science fiction ideas but they will the material soon because as i mentioned uh, when 10 feet above when was, uh, we grew if nobody no fly nobody believed that we can fly now we can fly up to the different planets so it is definitely possible uh, it, it students have to do it now yeah it is possible Uh, it was very nicely answered, sir, when you said that uh, cancer cells are immortal and the telomere is uh, rather mortal. So yeah. this shows, you know, that when scientifically we analyze ourselves, then death is no more a fear. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, sir. Well, well, of course, one problem with this thing is that if you don't die, planet cannot uh, sustain us. No, because if we are nine billion people, how many people this planet can sustain? So somebody has to go. <laughs> So that oh. is how the spiritual quotient also has come into picture, sir, in the yeah. scientific investigation. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, sir. The one question is how about development in diabetes of the nano medicine? How nano medicines are working in the development? Yeah, of uh, for diabetes, there are many many methods now. The only method that we currently use is to decrease the blood glucose. Okay, that's what we are now trying to do. Whatever method that we, but. Why is it happening? Because glucose is not entering the cell. Glucose should enter the cell so that it will do the physical activities, everything. Now, because it's not able to enter, then glucose levels in the blood is increasing. Now we are doing whatever ways of it. If you can do, you can modify the cell to take more glucose inside. It means pathway for the cell to be open to take the glucose in. If you can open new receptors, okay, create a new, engineer a new receptor. to take the glucose inside then this problem can be minimized now the people are trying to work on can we generate an artificial glucose uh, receptors okay Gl glucose has to go inside glucose channels glucose can we do that that is one possibility people are looking at not nano not nano but this one another way is that uh, insulin which is being given you can convert insulin to nano make a nano insulin particle that particle you swallow this slowly releases insulin so that you don't take insulin tab insulin injection every day but you make a nano insulin capsule which you take once that will release insulin with the time very very slowly because nano particle slow the idea was that once in 25 days once you take insulin levels will maintain for 25 days so this was made it is not a story it was made but technical some technical reasons are there it's actually made in india only it was made but some of the technical problems are there it's not yet gone on but nano insulin is one possibility but without in worrying about insulin if you can push the glucose inside into the cells by any other method it will be good and people are trying to see whether any receptors can be modified okay. the questions were similar related to nano medicine and its cure in hiv aids as well uh, in leukemia yeah but in all in all the cases what will be the nano role will be in any case if for example cancer let us take let us take cancer in cancer what is happening cells are dividing uncontrolled so to, to treat that we will give a medicine which this medicine will kill any cell that is dividing any cell that dividing the body it will kill. it means it will remove the hair hair will be lost throat lining will be lost and this will cause solve problems in addition to treating the cancer but in the nano you can put the cancer medicine in the nano particle and this nano particle on the surface as a as a uh, as antibody as antibody as a recognition molecule this goes in the body but doesn't do anything only when cancer cell is there and the cancer cell surface it recognizes then binds to it and releases the drug only to cancer cell it means your hair is saved your other body is saved everything else is saved only that is killed so this is nano encapsulated uh, drug delivery cancer will be useful very 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 useful. So, such a things are coming up other diseases also but there some sometimes is a stealth mechanism are used stealth in the sense that body should not recognize that you have put the medicine because body will go and antibodies will go and stop it so you do stealth technology with the nano combination to deliver the drug at a place where we need it if we do that any disease we may use less amount of drug because we are not allowing everywhere and less amount more effective that possibility comes so it means treatment becomes much more easier for example many diseases cancer treatment aids treatment treatment is more dangerous than the disease itself so that can be minimized with the nano technology thank you so much sir one last question by uh, one of the participants and that is related to 
to the cost of narrow medicines whether it is affordable for an average person i think which you have already answered to yes no the point here is that point here is that uh, for development of a drug the drug companies other people spend lot of money they pay salaries to people and all so that money they have to recover so initially drugs should be costlier but with the time the drug cost will become uh, very very small but precisely the cost of production not cost of market price cost of production is very very low okay cost of production in our country is very very low it doesn't have to cost money high money at all but the companies when they sell they sell for what it is used for what purpose are you using okay and they make their money so but it will come down it will come down as uh, quality is increase all this thing will become very affordable good that sir you have opened the see reveal the secret that production cost is less and uh, uh, other cost you know adds to the cost yeah, no no i actually truly truly production cost is for example beer bottle one beer bottle production cost may be 1 or 2 rupees it will cost 150 150 rupees because of all taxes <laughs> okay so no this for everything every <clears throat> dr yadav will know very well uh, his chemicals when he synthesizes the chemicals the chemical the actual component of active principal cost cost is not high but the cost is high because of you have to pay salaries for so many people who develop this compound so the initial investment is there that money has to come they spend 10 crores to make the molecule so 10 crores have to come so they have to put the price so that this price is not under our control even this answer was given very scientifically sir and it was very convincing also uh, <laughs> coming to one last question that if nanotechnology can be equated with the regeneration of organs in future as umbilical cords are stored these days so can we regenerate organs from it other than regenerate the, uh, organs from which from uh, umbilical cord ah yeah yeah no yeah see that is a that was the older idea actually not very old uh, whenever the child is born umbilical cord cells are stored with the idea that these stem cells can be utilized for future treatment diseases treatments or generating organs and things like that uh, for that people have collected huge amount of money charge again 70000 rupees 80000 rupees the doctors uh, hospital charge collect the cells and keep it where do they keep it they have to keep it in cryo conditions like a very low temperature conditions when the child may need it the child is now born child may need it when he reaches 50 years so 40 50 years so you have to maintain the cryo conditions for 40 50 years that is very expensive how, how long you think in india you can maintain a refrigerator for uh, how many days okay so it is very less likely and second thing is how many <laughs> cells will be regenerated all cells will not regenerate so cells may not regenerate so it is less likely to be useful but what is useful today's technology is you can make stem cells from adult cells so you don't worry about your embryonic cells see embryonic cells are will kept don't worry about them you can take your skin cell you can take your skin cell remove the nucleus put other nucleus you can create what we call efc efc said you can create embryonic stem cells artificial sorry the stem cells artificial you can make your artificial <clears throat> stem these stem cells can be utilized so because of this technology the storage is not required but once you just this stem cells stem cells they can be utilized for any treatment modality so we have a moving storage along with us going ah on. correct you see but the point here is that i was advising many people earlier that want to spend 80000 rupees for a storing the umbilical cord cells don't do it it's not necessary your cells can be taken and made into stem cells at that time we can convert any cell into we can take a gum cell in fact in our lab we have done a gum uh, dental dental surgeons we can take a gum cells those gum material from the gum you can make stem cells so those stem cells can be used for any other purpose. so you have your own gum cells with you your stem cells with you you can use them so there is no problem so much. thank you so much sir it was very informative it arose curiosity among all of us you know and we were keen to ask more and more but now time you know uh, yes. is the, yeah. the one you know which constrains us and i now invite uh, uh, hod department of biosciences dr vijay singh to have his concluding remarks on the webinar hello uh, thank you everybody so i am very happy and uh, had the opportunity to conclude this uh, wonderful talk and it is really very informative so i started with the very basic where 4.5 billion year ago is when there is the blasting of the things and uh, we know in a documentary there is the sixth time the earth was broken and we are in the seventh uh, time is everything is evolve as a life form it is started from the bacteria to come into the human so it is very very systematic uh, study 
so for us we need to really have the lot of passion to go through the back and see and the you we see already what are the similarities we have from the bacteria to the human if you look the inside the cell there is the atgc this nucleotide is still is the same in the bacteria and the human we can see the amino acids 20 it is also the same with the bacteria to the humans and all the planet so we can consider the life is still started from the one ancestor through the several modification genome very suppling suppling and multicellular coming so we evolve in a such a way that we are here as a modern human and this human is also belongs to the we thanks to the dinosaur because the dinosaur was the last yeah. and we come after that as a mammalian with a small mouse like mammal and we slowly evolve with this throughout the evolution so human is evolved i think in 3 lakh year ago in the ethiopia where the first our ancestor was there so we are in the i think the 5000 generation so this is the one of the thoughts and we know this thing so sir was very keen and they have very basic understanding then it started with the molecular biology and we know the molecular biology is the one of the basic component and basic area if we know then we understand the cell because the atgc the dna is made in the cell and uh, it is going to transcribe in the form of the rna and they are going to make the protein so if we understand at least two mechanism one is the central dogma where the dna is convert into the rna and rna is going to convert into the protein and we need to maintain that things as sir was saying that telomeric reason is very very important reason to maintaining the aging so i remember last four five year back in united states there is one ladies they did the elongation of the telomeric reason and i think she was 50 year and she looks like the 40 year of the age so the telomeric really help to maintain the aging factor and it was proven and it was the thing and how the protein is going to affect our body and how it is going to convert if it, they are misleading misfunction and the, we are going to suffer with the, a lot of disease without because of the protein is not proper functioning protein is misfolding protein is error sometimes there is mutation in the dna so we are going to get longer protein and longer protein is going to give another disease so sometimes shorter protein the shorter protein also give the another disease so so first i think we need to maintain real real situation what we are fully nicely relaxing because if we put some pressure some stress to our brain our body so the alignment is mismatch if the alignment is mismatch is the brain cell they are going to produce a lot of hormones and the neurotransmitters they are going to misbehaving so this may have this behavior also affect our body so uh, we really need to because the body have the emotion uh, like the memory and the brain have the intelligence uh, thought process so thought process and body emotion should be aligned together in order to make all the cells should be properly functionally active and working so if this cell is not properly functioning acting then we have the problem of the disease and disease is one single mutation for example in the sickle cell anemia so we are going to suffer with the sickle cell problem and there is no medicine is available in this planet to treat a single gene mutation in the cell so as sir said that the, there is a future of the crispr cas technology so uh, in harvard the george church he is the one of the big geneticist and he has the company of the editas medicine so editas medicine have the license to treat this type of the dg sickle cell anemia thal thalassemia muscular dystrophy so if you have the problem and the disease go there and they can take the somatic cell and they can re again put your body and at least you can get some rescue of the disease so it is us fda approved company and they are working and uh, jennifer tauna she is also the received the nobel prize in last month so Hello. in this month so this is a ground breaking technology yes we need to really understand yes, yes, yes.
for the single gene mutation correction because we have more than 100 of the gene that is correct two gene mutation three gene mutation and there is no medicine and we use this genome editing technology and uh, correct this proper mutation and the repair the dna and the dna is going to give the function and there was the one issues when you do this uh, correction during the mutation problem correcting in the dna the dna double helix is going to cut and break and you are going to insert again the repaired and the proper dna so sometime this cutting the the guide rna you choose for the cutting and making the, where it can be bind so sometime it give the off target effect that, so this problem. off target effect is going to give the another additional problem in your body you are going to correct sickle cell but they can give the they can bind anywhere because it's very very small 20 base pair sequences and it give a lot of off target effect in order to reduce the off target effect in the harvard there is the david louis he developed the another version of the crispr technology that is fused with the dmna enzyme and another version so this can not going to cut the double stranded break but it can help to only the what is the mutation they can repair so because the a is going to convert into the c and the t is going to convert into g so we can convert only single beam mutation in the same so this is the another and additional layer of the genome engineering technology and there are the more than 1000 paper was published based on this without cutting but they can repair and the telomerase this is one of the very good area where i think if when you born then you can measure what are the telomeric region we have every 15 year you can measure if the telomeric region is going to reduce i think we can extend somehow the crispr can also allow to extend with the crispr this ladies have this uh, addition sequences they added so but sometimes we don't know what is the effect if you extend longer and we don't know how much long we can add. so in order to reduce all the things we need to be an up royal and we need to be honest being a scientist our responsibility we are very very few percentage and our responsibility is to help the society because we know where is the problem and how we can solve so the research it is start from the basic and it should be translated into the for example for the diagnostic of the number of the disease india especially we are suffering the rapid sensitive and the specific diagnostic so for example the cancer it is very very bad disease and sometime maybe 40% or 50% cancer because of the mutation in p53 gene so because tumor suppressing gene if it's not working then we have the problem so the cancer diagnostic generally it comes second and third stage sometime because we don't have the early level of the diagnostic tool that can detect when the cancer is in the primary stage then you can treat properly so diagnostic we suffering a lot like the last uh, from this corona novel corona virus still we are suffering with the diagnostic the corona infection we have but we don't have the diagnostic sensitive diagnostic that can detect very very low percentage of the protein which we have the yeah, antibody we have yeah concentration of the corona virus so at least 1000 corona virus per microliter if it's available then our platinum based real time pcr technique can detect it so this level the threshold is very very important so we need maybe the nanotechnology can help crispr technology can help to upregulate because in the mit with the crispr technology they have developed the auto level sensitive diagnostic tool so 10 to power minus 18 so this is the specific sensitive and very good tool to detect so i think this is the about all the field is moving and the, we have basic understanding then applied understanding and the translational research so now we need to move more and more because we have some level of the understanding of the molecular biology evolution genetics and we can move in the further translational nanotechnology crispr technology and the, with the genome sequence we have the india i think they have the india genome so there are the 10000 human healthy human is going to sequence in india and we can get more and more data 
So data storage, data analysis, data is uh, now the challenging how we can store. So we can go through the, as I said, this is the time of the, we need to change into the artificial intelligence. So it may be in the year 10 year later, there is no requirement of the more teacher. One teacher can teach entire India, one class in the same time. So the extension of the teaching and the artificial intelligence can really lead mining of the data, clouding of the data, and the data, how we can analyze, how we can fit it. So there is a time to make the bioinformatics more useful because of the, we need to check at the level of the human where we have the problem and we can see and the particular medicine, what are the genetic mutation we have, which medicine you need. So everything is going to more personalized more and more like Europe and the UK and the America. So I think this is really very informative, sir. And uh, we like a lot, so your talk. And uh, we hope uh, if the pandemic, this corona is going back, so you will be again here like last year. So that is really very good. So thank you so much, sir. Thank you. So Dr. Mohanra. Thank you, yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, here. Yeah, Dr. Adho. It was again very enjoying lecture as ever. I don't know how many lecture I have heard from you <laughs> <laughs> because we were together at many places. I, I know, yeah, we went to many colleges together. AP Academy of Science, Telangana Academy of Science. What is, uh, you know, appreciate more? Each time you have a different material. That's good. <laughs> so even a person like me listening to you again and again doesn't get bored. Huh? Always yeah. new material. So thank you. And thank you. I thank, you. That. thank you so much. And I hope you'll get opportunity to visit our center sometime. Surely, surely. I would like to visit and uh, interact with the, uh, your research scientists so that, you know, it will be useful for, uh, for every one of us. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Your, your this fellowship is up to what time? Which one? Our uh, the distinguished camp. Oh, yeah, this is, this is there up to January end. This is uh, January 21. Then, 2001 January. They will extend, you know, further? Uh, they may extend, but I'm not really looking for and I'm not asking for extension. Uh, I may do, I don't know, I'm, I may do things, other things. Uh, Elie Prasad Institute is asking me to uh, come there. And University of Hyderabad is asking me. So I have to, I probably will not be with CSR. Okay, anymore. I will talk to you later, okay? I will not be with the CSR any longer. <laughs> I may not be the CSR any longer. No, I will talk to you later some. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Okay. 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 Thank you. I'll, I'll now leave. Yes, Thank you yes, so sir. much. Now, sir, just a minute, sir. Uh, yeah. It's actually customary yeah. to. Yeah. yeah, you're saying something? I invite us, Dean Sleering, to propose vote of thanks. Over to Amish, sir. Okay. Thank you, Namrata, madam. So it is a very, we are very fortunate enough to have Dr. C.H. Mohan Rao with us because I can see the pain he is taking in preparing the slides, conveying the message and informing the young buddies and uh, just parking them with the, what is going on in the area of biology, nanobiology, nanomicrobiology. It is very interesting, sir. And especially I like the way you present it, your presentation. I learned a lot from that. So... Uh, Thank you very much, sir, because your presence itself is uh, a very precious moment for us. And uh, thank you very much for sparing your valuable time for the students of Ingersoll University and in benefit of all the biology, academia, biology fraternity. So thank you very much. I would like to thank Dr. J.S. Yadav, sir, also because uh, he is a, a media uh, who arranged all these things and uh, Without support of Dr. J.S. Yadav, it would not have been possible. So thank you very much, Dr. J.S. Yadav, sir, for your kind uh, support, time, cooperation, everything. I would like to thank Dr. Bharti Dawit, because she is hey, taking hey, hey, <laughs> <laughs> Sir, you, Sir, you are there. You are always there with us. And that is why these all things are happening. So we can't uh, uh, ignore that, sir. Uh, I would like to thank Dr. Bharti uh, Dave also because she is the she is there to motivate the students to attend the lecture. Even I remember she told me that whether engineering students will join or not. I said yes, definitely will join. 
and today my engineering students also join your lecture and they definitely learned a lot because it is not a, now you know the area will come where people will not be identified by engineer or science or something like this they will be identified by the bunch of knowledge that's it they will not be a mechanical or chemical or a computer engineer they will be just engineer similarly like science they will be just a science graduate that's it <coughs> so there is no limitation or boundary for knowing the things and uh, thank you again sir for uh, sharing these things to my students also thank you bharti ma'am for uh, inviting uh, engineering students along with the science students to attend this program and giving them an opportunity to learn a lot from dr c h mohan rao i would like to thank dr vijay singh he narrated and concluded the remarks in a very wide way broad way and also shared many informative things during the concluding remarks so thank you very much dr vijay singh i would like to thank, thank you, dr namrata bajaj uh, dr namrata bajaj is always there i don't know how many times should i say thank you to her because she is always present uh, and uh, uh, take a command of all the sessions so thank you very much ma'am uh, madam and yes i would like to thank my admission team who, who is at the backstage to uh, run this show run this webinar very effectively without any interruption <laughs> and uh, not but at the least but i would like to thank all my students all the participants who have attended till the end i could see the more than 290 participants were there and it's a very good achievement very big achievement sir so thank you very much to all the participants thank you very much to indrasil university the management of indrasil university dr mr abhinand pandya colonel sharma everyone i if i miss any name i apologize for that but those who have directly indirectly contributed in successful conduction of this webinar thank you all thank you very much and thanks to almighty uh, who made us or uh, made this possible to have dr ch mohanra with us thank you very much amis thank you 29 295 only on this no but yes sir yeah, on on this is. webinar i have not counted the facebook or other media youtube facebook this is ah, only so on they, our they, yes there will be equally same number i'm sure yes sir yes sir it would be more so total may be crossing 500 i can say ha ah, right you yes know, sir uh, dr mohanra yeah. realize webinar more people are attending than the actual one. i know i know ंग <laughs> <laughs> Okay, yeah. Okay, Amish. Yes, sir. You cannot differentiate between science and engineer, eh? Science. No, sir. Not at all. That's what I said. Yes, that sir. now no more. Okay. There is a differentiation. Ah, yes, uh, if engineers know science, he can do far far better. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And that's why we yes. are lucky enough that today we have a person like Dr. C. S. Mohan Rao, and Madam gave us an opportunity to attend all these students, this uh, webinar. Sir. Okay, then. Thank you so much, everyone. On this auspicious, on the auspicious occasion of Shashti today, uh, I uh, invoke goddess to bless us all with peace, good health, and happiness. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. You, thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone.